What depression, discouragement, despair often brings is distorted information. Elijah is by himself. Depression gets worse if there's nobody in your life to change your thinking. See, if you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're talking to yourself, that's a bad conversation for yourself. You're already feeling sorry and there's nobody to talk to but you, about you, regarding you, to tell you what you ought to do and you aren't in a place to even hear you correctly, then your discussion with yourself is helping yourself to become worse off about you. So God then enters the picture and tells him, Elijah, tell me how you feel. Stop talking to yourself. Because when you talk to yourself, you were getting depressed, you were suicidal, start talking to me, okay? Now I'm going to show you the wind and the rain and all that stuff. Now y'all talk to me, because you talking to you is killing you. Says I don't want you to kill you, stop talking you to you, and y'all talk to me. God has an angel for you, he's got a person for you, he has himself for you. He gave Elijah all three of those to give him a supernatural experience to lift him out of his depression. And one of the reasons that the church exists is to have people available in your life when you are down who can embrace you, minister to you, lift you up, and he can use you to do the same thing for somebody else. Because when we are depressed, we need another perspective. That doesn't deny the reality of how we feel. But what it does is it doesn't let you live there. We are looking at the life of Elijah to discover the supernatural. And I don't want you to miss the point. I want you to get this. And today we're going to be introduced to him and learn about a lesson about God's supernatural provision. The context in which Elijah appears on the scene, he appears in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're told in verse 1, now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead. Tishbe, or if you were from there, you'd be called a Tishbite, was the place Elijah was from. Now, we don't know a lot about Elijah. He just kind of breaks in on the scene, and he comes like out of nowhere. His name means Yahweh is my God. That tells us a little bit about his mother and father who named them. They were obviously people of faith that they would name him that way. Prophets, as Elijah was, showed up because there was a spiritual issue among God's people that needed to be addressed. Prophets were there to bring God's message in the midst, typically, of spiritual decline. Well, the scenario that brings Elijah on the scene is summarized for us in chapter 16, verses 32 and 33. So he erected an altar, that is King Ahab, erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. This Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So the context that brings Elijah on the scene is idolatry. Ahab the king has begun worshiping Baal and he brings the rest of Israel to worship Baal with him. He not only worships Baal, he worships Baal's girlfriend, Asherah. Because Baal and Asherah, kind of like boyfriend and girlfriend, work together to bring fertility to Israel. They look to this idol to bring fertility to Israel. Uh, let me define an idol again so that you understand its meaning. An idol is an unauthorized noun, person, place, or thing. It's an unauthorized noun that you look to to meet the needs in your life. You're looking to it. Idols weren't just something that was there. 
It was you looking to that something that was there to do something for you. So in places around the world, people will worship the sun and the moon and the stars and the water and the trees. But they're not just worshiping that to worshiping that. They're doing that because they're hoping their worship of that thing brings something to them. Now, you and I over here, we don't worship those kind of idols. We worship American idols. We worship people and popularity and, and, and power and prestige and possessions because we look to it to meet a need. When you look to an unauthorized noun or when you look to an authorized noun in an unauthorized way, you have an idol. You don't need a tree. They could be an actor, an actress, an entertainer. It could be your bank account. It could be your house. It could be the people living in your house. When you look to them in an unprescribed way from God, you just created an idol. So before we go any further, are there any idolaters in the house? So Elijah comes in verse 1 and he says to Ahab the king, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Uh, Ahab, God told me to tell you heaven's going to close. No dew, no rain, and it's not going to be for a day, a month, or a year. It's going to be for years. There's going to be a downturn in the agricultural economy. Okay, who's your daddy now? Uh, who's your God now? Let's see what Baal can do now. Let's see what Asherah can do now. God attacks Israel at the place of their idolatry because they were looking for Baal and Asherah to bring about fertility even in the land. So that whatever you are worshiping because it's unauthorized or it's authorized and you're worshiping it in an unauthorized way, don't be surprised when God shuts it down to let you know that is an idol. So he removes the provision. Now the word of the Lord comes to Elijah in verse 2 saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself at the brook of Cherith, which is in the east of Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. That's our word provide. So I'm going to use the natural provision of a brook. But I'm going to provide for you another way, supernaturally. Because I'm going to call on the Raven Catering Service <laughs> to supply you food morning and evening. They're going to give you bread and meat. That's called a sandwich. <laughs> They're going to give you bread and meat morning and evening. Now, that ain't normal. A brook that you can drink from, that's normal. But having birds fly in with a sandwich <laughs> twice a day, having waiters fly in on schedule every day in a drop, that ain't normal. Oh, but it's worse than that. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 11 to 14, God tells his people, don't mess with ravens, they are unclean birds. Deuteronomy 14, 11 to 14, ravens are unclean. You may not eat them, you don't mess with them because they're unclean. Well, what does that tell you about God's provision? That ought to tell you that God can use hell to bring heaven to you. See, you never want to box God in because while God does not sin and God does not tell you to sin, he often uses sin and uses sinful people to provide for his people. 
So the beautiful thing about God's provision is that you never want to box him in and you don't want to be so spiritual that you miss him using ravens to address the need in your life. Those are unclean birds. They were prohibited birds. But God is so God that even the devil has to be under his rule. He says, I want you to, I want you to go to the brook because I, I got some birds that got your back. I got some birds that are going to cover you at this place called Cherith. Now, this ought to free you up a little bit because that means the sky's the limit, the world's the limit. Now, what this means, in order to have a supernatural raven feeding you and to have birds listening to God to feed you, that means that God must be your only source. Your job is not your source. Your bank is not your source. Your employer is not your source. God is your only source. Everything else is a resource, a mechanism that God uses, and you must free him up to use whatever resource he wants to use, even if it comes from something you wouldn't normally understand it coming from. So he's there, Sheriff, eating two meals a day, drinking some fresh water. I mean, he's, he's, he's doing okay in a bad situation. Ah. Oh. Now we come to verse 7. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. So now he becomes a recipient of the very judgment everybody else is experiencing. So follow this. When he first gave it, God provided supernaturally. But now the economy is affecting him. The circumstances in the land are affecting him. The downturn is affecting him, and things dry up. So don't have anybody tell you, serve the Lord and things don't get dry. Serve the Lord and you don't lose your job. Serve the Lord and your bank account doesn't get drained. Serve the Lord and things don't break down and dip into the savings that you didn't plan to use for that. Don't let anybody tell you that if you're in God's will, he was in God's will, that things don't still dry up said the brook dried up. It was judgment on the land and he lived in the atmosphere of the judgment so he was affected too. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him. When the word of the Lord come to him? When things dried up. Okay. The word of the Lord came to him and told him where to go for the catering service, the raven catering service. So he's you know, eating sandwiches every day, twice a day. He's drinking his water. All of a sudden, the, what's happening in society is now affecting him. And now the word of the Lord comes to him again. Okay, let me explain something. When God allows things to dry up in your life, it is because he's moving you to a different provider. When God allows things to dry up, in your life, it is because he has a different plan. So God says to him, go to Zarephath. Arise, verse 9. Go to Zarephath with belongs to Sidon and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Okay, I have problems with this. First of all, Zarephath is the Baal belt. You know, this is the Bible belt. That was the Baal belt. That was the center of Baal worship is Zarephath in Sidon. God will often test your faith by sending you places you don't prefer to go because it doesn't make sense. How's a widow who's down her last meal as you're going to see him? Well, help me. She can't help herself. But God said, I commanded the widow 
and she's going to be your new provider. But he was close enough to God to hear his voice. Hmm. So he arose, because Elijah's a man of faith, so he's not going to just listen to God to say amen. He got up. He arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a woman was there gathering sticks, and he called out to her and said, please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And she was going to get it. He called and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. So why does he say this to a woman? Well, God said there's going to be a widow. He comes to the city, he sees a woman. But is this the woman or are there other women? How do I know that this is the one? So he says, well, give me some water, give me some bread to see if this was the one that God had to provide for him. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread. Only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Wait a minute, I'm confused. Didn't, didn't we just read God had commanded the woman? In fact, Elijah says to her in verse 13, do not fear. So she's scared. I don't see the command because she's scared to death because she's down the last meal. Here's this man asking for stuff. He says, make me, verse 13, a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me and afterwards you may make one for yourself and for your son. He tells her, this is what I need you to do. I need you to make me my bread first and then and then you take care of you and your son, and when you do, this is what God's going to do. He says, for thus the Lord God of Israel says, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. He gives her a promise from God. All this woman has is a promise and a final meal. The question is whether she's going to believe the preacher. But not because he's the preacher, but because he's saying, thus saith the Lord. What was he challenging her to do? He was challenging her to put God first. She was, he was challenging her to faith because all she had was a promise from a preacher. But his job was to get her to act in faith for her, because she was going to be the beneficiary of her faith. He was going to be too, because she was going to make a bread cake for him. So what does the lady do? Verse 15, so she went and did according to the word of Elijah, which was the word of the Lord. And what happened? It says, and she and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. So now let me give you the secret of your provision. Elijah, we got to leave here because this is dried up. I got a widow. I know, I know this doesn't make sense, but I got a widow over there. She doesn't have much, but she's going to take care of you. So you do what I told you. You go over there. And you minister to her. You create faith in her. And when you create faith in her, she's going to take care of you. But when she takes care of you out of obedience to me because you excited faith in her, I'm going to take care of her. Or to put it in the words of Scripture, Luke 6, 38, give and it, the thing you give, will be given back to you. Press down, overflowing. Because it says, and they will return it back to you. The secret to your provision is to be a provider for somebody who needs what you need so that God can use what they need, that's what you need, to bless them and return it back to you. The question is, do you need what God has to offer? That's the question. 
And this is not just about money. It can be relationships. It can be, it can be helping hand. It can be God uh, pricking you to, to reach out to somebody who's sad because you need encouragement. So you decide, well, you know, I need encouragement. So let me find somebody who needs encouragement. God, lead me to somebody who needs encouragement. So when I encourage them, you'll bring somebody to encourage me and you'll work this thing around. And so God, lead. this is not just about tithes and offerings. It is about God being able to work through you to benefit somebody else so he can come back to you and give you the miracle you've been looking for. It's the supernatural circle of provision. He invoked her faith. If I can ever get you and me and us to move in faith, not talk in faith, but to move in faith, then heaven opens up and God blows your mind that somebody who makes less than you can feed you and almost retire at the same time. We got some folks here who are living by faith, who are on bare incomes, who God has blessed. We had one sister who, she, she just lived on sub, sub, subsistence. She had three kids. She's a widow. And God brought a man who gave her his house. You never know how God's going to come at you. You never know where he's going to come from. But you'll never see it. If he sees idolatry, you'll see a famine in the land. And it may not be a famine of money. It could be a famine of peace. It could be a famine of confidence. It could be a famine of, of stability. It could be a, there are all kind of famines. Because you are doing what the land does, worshiping another God and unauthorized worship. So the question on the floor is who's your source? Because I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, that's Old Testament. That's in the Old Testament. I don't believe that works today. I don't believe that principle applies today. So let me close by quoting you Luke 4, verse 24. When Jesus is rejected in his own hometown, he says, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own hometown. Talking about himself. But I say to you the truth. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the skies were shut up for three years and six months when a great famine came over all the land and yet Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Girlfriend that made it from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament with a new prophet whose name is Jesus. And Jesus says, let me reach back to the old prophet. He said, there were a whole lot of widows in Israel, but God sent to the only one. And the one he sent her to didn't even go to church. She was the widow of Zarephath. She was a Gentile. But because she was willing to act in faith, she was the only one who got the miracle, even though there were a lot of widows who could have gotten the miracle, but they were living as idols. But because this one foreign woman was willing to believe the prophet, a greater than Elijah is here. I am the prophet. So the question on the floor is, are you going to be that unique person that God supernaturally provides for? Does he have somebody over there, over there, over there, and over there, and over there, and the rest of y'all just go home? How many widows who are willing to trust him does he have in a crowd? And guess what? Jesus said, one good one will do. You only have one source, one provider, and that's God. He uses many different resources or mechanisms through which he makes the provision, but never confuse the resources that he uses as your source. When you do, you've made your resource God, one source. That's why in the life of Elijah, he shifts sources. In one minute, he uses an unclean raven. The next minute, he uses the widow of Zarephath because God can shift sources anytime he chooses. That's why when you get 
disappointed because he didn't use the same source that he used last time. It's because we've gotten confused that resources can vary. If this job doesn't work out, God can create another opportunity elsewhere. If this person doesn't come through, he's got more than one person he can use. If, if this bank doesn't cooperate, he can, he can come up with another scenario. I mean, God has the world of options open to him. So make sure you don't make as an idol your resources, but you keep focused on your provider, and that is God. And when you keep focused on him and watch his provision of meeting your needs, like he says in Philippians 4.19, my God is able to meet your need because Paul understood God alone is the source. So thank him that he is your source for every area of your life. Keep your focus on him. Thank him for the resources he's currently using, but always leave that door open for new resources he chooses to use. The Tony Evans Study Bible. The what, you ask? Filled with devotionals, articles, questions and answers, and so much more, Dr. Evans brings a perspective no other author ever has to the Word of God with his unique voice and powerful insights. Featuring inspirational articles, videos, and more, Dr. Evans explains God's Word in a fresh, relevant way. Get yours today. Why does God leave you in an incurable situation so we can get around to finding out who God really is? And when we do, Dr. Tony Evans says that's the time we see the Lord's power at work. Not only can he cure what's been a problem for years, he can take you back before it was a problem at all. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. Words like impossible or incurable don't apply when God is part of the equation. But Dr. Evans says seeing miracles happen is in some ways up to us. Let's join him as he takes us to 2 Kings chapter 5 for the story of an important man in a desperate situation. This man was a leper. Something so wrong that it messed up everything that was so right. And there was no cure. It was incurable. So he is both simultaneously a captain, a conqueror, and a castaway. Most importantly, leprosy is tied to something going wrong spiritually. This man with everything right has one thing wrong messing up all that is right. What is your leprosy? What is that one thing in your life that is messing up all the good stuff going for you? And maybe you're successful in your career or with your finances or with your educational achievements. And maybe you can hand out a resume that is impressive, but there's that one thing that you dare not put on it. 
That was Naaman's reality. That was his scenario. He had the, the butt phrase, but he was a leper. The footnote on his life, affecting everything. Well, we're told in verse 2 that in one of his battles, he captured a little slave girl. She told Naaman's wife, if we could get your husband, my boss, down to Israel to the prophet, Elisha, I believe Elisha could change his leprosy situation. She was a little girl. She was a nobody in terms of her position in life and her age in life, but she knew somebody. She had a hookup and a connection that could change this man's world and this man's life. So Naaman goes to his boss, the king, and says, this little girl told my wife who told me that I may be able to get my problem solved by the prophet in Israel. So the king, watch this, the king of Aram, verse 5 says, go now and I'm going to send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed, he took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothes, brought them to the king of Israel. And he says, I've sent Naaman, my servant, verse 6, to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. Well, wait a minute. That's not what the little girl said. The little girl said, there's a prophet in Israel that can cure his leprosy. Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the house of Elisha. He knocks on Elisha's door. Uh-oh, verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. Houston, we have a problem. We, we have some issues going on here. And the issue is explained to us in verse 11. But Naaman was furious, ticked off, mad, and went away and said, Behold, I thought, I'm coming back to that. He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand, hocus pocus, over the place and cure the leprosy. The end of verse 12 says, he went away in a rage. Because he said, are not Abana and far part of the rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Turned away, ticked off. It's called leaning to your own understanding. It's called throwing your human opinion at God. It's called pride. He said, Jordan's too dirty. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something. It's a bad idea to stay outside the ark just because dirty animals are going in it. It's, it's a bad idea when them nasty animals, two by two, are coming out, I ain't going in that ark. It's going to be stinky in there, animals in there, all that refuse in there. I ain't going in that. Okay, you're going to die. <laughs> so his servant comes to him and says, verse 13, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, Give him another million. Give, give him this, give him that. Would you not have done it? How much more than when he says, go wash and be clean? If he'd have given you something hard, you'd have gladly gone and done it. He'd give you something easy. And now you're going to fuss and cuss and get mad at the prophet, get mad at the church. You're just going to get mad because they didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. That's not the question. The question is, was what they told you God's word and God's will. That's the only question. So, verse 14, he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. Watch this. 
according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Don't let your dignity keep you from solving your problem. Partial obedience will not bring full deliverance. In fact, it may bring no deliverance. Because he was not delivered until after that seventh time. He had to complete what God was asking him to do. A lot of times people get mad. They say, I tried. I did what God said. But when you dig down deep enough, they did a part of what God said. They obeyed him enough to feel better about it. But they did not go all the way and complete what he had asked them to do. Until obedience has been completed, you cannot expect a supernatural incursion into your circumstances to calm it, correct it, and reverse it to whatever level the sovereign will of God will allow for. You and I must stop arguing with God's word. His word is final. It is settled in heaven. And sometimes you won't like it. And sometimes you won't understand it. In fact, if you can read your doctor's prescription, he's not a real doctor. <laughs> but even though you can't fully read it, even though you don't fully understand it, you go to the pharmacist, you fulfill it, and you take it because you trust the one who gave it. We say, well, I don't understand. I don't want to understand, so I'm not going to do anything. So you stay sick. Because even though you may not understand God's prescription, it's his prescription. And he knows what's really wrong. But until you take the medicine, not take the prescription, hear the sermon, no, you must take the medicine, that is, full obedience to see the supernatural into the natural to cure that which appears to be and actually functions as that which is incurable in your life. What is your leprosy? I want to tell you now, related to whatever deliverance God is going to give you for that thing that will not go away, that until you adopt, I adopt, we adopt radical obedience. That's obedience to the end. Even to the point of rejecting our own perspective or that of our friends. You'll not see God. You'll talk about him. You'll sing songs to him. You'll worship him, but you won't see him. You won't see this power that the Bible talks about, this victory that the Bible talks about. Because God's got to see faith, and faith is demonstrated by the walk, by the thing you do, not the thing you think, feel, or say. When a person gets stuck in quicksand, they go to what is natural to them. When you, none of us probably have been in quicksand, but you've seen movies with people in quicksand, and they go to what's natural. And what's natural is to flail your arms to try to get yourself out of this thing that's sucking you up. Well, the reason quicksand sucks you up is that it is sand mixed with water. When sand gets mixed with water, it removes the friction of sand being on sand. So since sand is no longer on sand, but now sand has been mixed with water, the friction of sand being with sand is no longer there. So the more you try to get out of it, the more it's sucking you under. The harder you try to get out of it, the harder it's sucking you under because you don't have anything with enough friction to push you against it. So when you push against it, the water is just, with the sand, is just drawing you down. But you're doing what's natural. If you get caught in quicksand, you have to do what is unnatural. You have to go against your natural inclination to fight to get out. And you must relax, which slows down the process of you being pulled down, which gives you time to paddle, not fight. And when you rest and paddle, which is against your natural inclination, 
you find out deliverance is possible. You go to what you naturally think is right and you are aiding and abetting your demise. That's how it is with God. Sometimes uh, when God wants to do something, you have to go against your... to your your mind your will your desires your goal because you want to be delivered dr evans will tell us more about the result of naaman's obedience when he continues our message in just a moment first though i want to let you know about tony's brand new book that explores what it takes to turn your life in a whole new direction even if you've spent years struggling in areas like financial responsibility, substance abuse, sexual promiscuity, or family sins that go back generations. You'll finally discover how to reverse flaws and failures that you thought were irreversible. The book is called U-Turns, Reversing the Consequences in Your Life, and it was designed to perfectly complement the teaching series you've been listening to today, U-Turn, Reversing Spiritual Consequences. For a limited time, we're bundling the book and all 12 audio messages in this series on both CD and digital download and sending them to you as our thank you gift when you make a contribution to help continue Tony's ministry. Just visit TonyEvans.org to get the details and make the arrangements. 
And if you want to explore the subject of spiritual turnarounds even further, or perhaps prepare yourself to lead others in these life-changing truths, be sure to look into the companion Bible study and DVD kit that Dr. Evans has prepared to accompany the U-Turns book and audio messages. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Or let one of our resource team members help you day or night at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. Well, Dr. Evans will return in just a moment. Whether you're facing a decision or a dilemma, it's smart to ask, what would Jesus do? But first you have to know what Jesus did and what God has to say about the situations you face. Well, if building your biblical foundation is your goal, the help you need is as close as your computer or mobile device, thanks to the Tony Evans Training Center. It's packed with online courses covering core concepts of the faith and in-depth scripture studies you can work through any time you want at any pace you want. Along the way, you'll explore key teachings and learn how to apply them in real-world situations. There's lots of exclusive content from Tony to keep you interested and motivated and an online forum where you can ask questions, get answers, and collaborate with other students. It's almost like having a seminary on your smartphone. Visit TonyEvans.org today and connect with the Tony Evans Training Center where you can explore the kingdom anytime, anywhere. His flesh, verse 14, became like the flesh of a little child. Whoa. Okay, don't, don't read that too fast. Wait a minute. He came to be delivered. He came up the seventh time not only was he delivered, but God took him all the way back to babyhood. He got delivered and restored. God reversed that thing. It took him, this is a grown man, and it took him to the day he came out of his mother's womb as a child or an infant. God is so powerful. Not only can he cure what's been a problem for years, he can take you back before it was a problem at all. That's called exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. It says, he's saying, heal me. God says, I'm going to make you like a little baby. Why does God leave you in an incurable situation? So we can get around to finding out who God really is. He doesn't just want to be your buddy. He doesn't want to be just another guy. He wants to show you when he shows out and shows off, he's in a class all by himself. Psalm 103 verses 2 and 3 says, He forgives our sins and he heals our diseases. He claimed God was the only God, but look at something else he does as we come to an end. Verse 17. If not, please let your servant at least be given Two mules load of earth for your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Ooh. He said, watch this. The dirt I didn't want to go down in, Jordan, I want two loads of it and two mules. Because I'm carrying this dirt back with me. Because on this dirt, I'm going to build me an altar so I can worship the only true God. I'm taking my blessing with me. Everywhere I go, I'm going to make a pile of dirt. I'm going to set up my altar and I'm going to worship God. Because guess what? When God delivers you like this, when he takes away your leprosy, when he reverses something that's been messing with you for days, months, years, and decades, and you come to see, this is no joke. God is no joke. He can meet you in your deepest hole, reverse you back to a baby status. You're going to want that God every place else you go. Yeah. There's another verse I want to mention in closing. Luke 4.27 says, There were many lepers in Israel. But God healed none of them except Naaman. Now that's in the New Testament. Jesus is talking. He said there were many folk like Naaman in Israel. But none of those folk 
in Israel who are my people got healed from their leprosy except a foreigner named Naaman because he's not a Jew. What's he saying? You can be part of the people of God and never see God work. You can come to church every week. You can be an Israelite and a leper and live the rest of your life as a leper because you refuse to do what a foreigner did. A foreigner bleeds God, tell the end, got a miracle, the folk in church worship God, got nothing because of their unbelief. We have in our community a lot of places that clean things. We have cleaners that cleans clothes. We have car washes, it cleans cars. We've got nail salons, it cleans messed up nails and cuticles. People go into those places because something dirty and messed up needs to be corrected and cleansed. That's why they go in there. And when they come out, something is different. You go pick up your clothes and the cleaners has cleaned them. You come out of the hair salon and the hair is, is now clean and it's, and it's been uh, shaped and, and, and straightened or curled or whatever y'all do. It, it is, it, the, the hair is, is, is all right now. You take your car to the car wash. You drive it to the car wash. It comes out different than it came in. You go to the nail salon with dirty nails, the nails come out, the nails have been cleaned, they've been shaped, they've been uh, uh, colored, you know, you come out different than you went in. Now the reason why you come out different than when you went in is when you went in, you did exactly what they asked you to do. The cleaner said, give me the clothes and turn it over to me. You turn it over to them, then you back clean clothes. You hook the car up, you drive it up to the place they tell you, they hook it up, you go and you wait, you do what they tell you to do, comes out clean. You put your nails over here, you do, you do what they tell you to do and you come out different. But in the church, folk come into the church dirty, hear from God what to do, and leave the same way they came in because they refused to do what the instruction manual demanded. So if you want to see God in your situation, you're going to have to put down your pride, put down your notoriety. You can't be like the guy who used to come to our church. He was well known in the community, very wealthy. He came to the church, joined the church. He said, I want to meet with you. He wanted to meet with me. I said, yes, when we met. He said, I want to be a leader. I said, excuse me? He said, I want to be a leader. Well, I said, okay, well, there's a process you have to go through. We want to see you faithful in ministry. He said, I don't need to do all that. He said, you know, you, do you know who I am? I said, I know who you are. He said, yeah, and uh, a lot of churches. They shouldn't hit me with that line. A lot of churches would be happy to have me in their leadership. I, I told him, well, I'll give you directions to one of them. Which one you want? What he was trying to do was use Naaman's money, clout, and power to buy position. That's not how it happens in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, you got to go low in spite of your notoriety, degrees, money, position, and power. You got to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. When we do to completion, what God has said do, you've opened yourself up to a Jordan experience, even in a dirty place. And by the way, the greatest miracle of all is when you dip yourself in the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. If you're ready to have that Jordan River experience for yourself, Tony would like to personally explain to you how it can happen. Just visit TonyEvans.org and follow the link that says Jesus. You'll learn exactly what it means to be a Christian, how to follow through on your decision, and what to do next. You'll find it all at TonyEvans.org. While you're there, don't forget to request your copy of Tony's current teaching series, U-Turn, Reversing Spiritual Consequences. 
As I mentioned earlier, all 12 life-changing lessons in this powerful two-volume collection are available along with this brand new book, U-Turns, for a limited time as our gift when you make a donation to help us keep Tony's teaching on the station. The Alternative is a completely listener-supported ministry, so we rely on your generosity to keep these messages coming your way each day. Visit TonyEvans.org to make your donation and request your copy of the U-Turn series. And be sure to take a look at the U-Turns Bible Study and DVD Kit. This package makes a great addition to your personal study and includes tips and teaching guides for leading others in a study of how God can redeem the bad choices they've made in the past. Again, drop by TonyEvans.org today or call our Resource Center at 1-800-800-3222. Team members are standing by to help you with your request day and night. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222. Even when the consequences of your mistakes seem irreversible, it's still not time to give up hope. But it may be time to give up something else. And Dr. Evans will tell us what that is tomorrow. I hope you'll join us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. Many of us are being hindered from our destiny because we're being held hostage by a leash around our souls called unforgiveness. Dr. Tony Evans explains why getting the pardon we need depends on the pardon we give. If you're holding on to vengeance, then you are blocking God from taking care of it for you. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. When we think of hostages, we picture people being held against their will or threatened in some other way. Today, Dr. Evans will talk about the kind of hostage who could walk away at any time but refuses to go. Get ready to turn to the book of Genesis as he explains. Two monks were on their way to a particular destination. On their way, they had to cross a shallow river to get to where they were going. They ran into uh, an older lady, a heavy set lady, who was sitting at the bank of the river that they had to cross. When they got to the bank of the river and saw the lady, the lady was crying and they asked her, what's wrong? She said, I can't cross the river. I, I, I don't know how to cross the river. I'm scared to cross the river. So, kindly, the monks picked up the lady and carried her across the river. When she got to the other side, she thanked them, went on her way, and they began to continue to their destination. But as they began to continue to their destination, one of the monks complained about the pain in his back. He said, boy, carrying that woman across, she was heavy set and it was difficult walking across the river and, and my back is hurting so bad. The other monk said, well, let's, let's keep on going. But after a few more steps, he said, I, I can't make it. I'm, I'm hurting too bad. The other monk said to him, what's wrong? He says, I, I'm carrying the woman. I, I'm hurting too bad. He says, aren't you hurting? The other monk said, uh, no, I, I got rid of her five miles ago. He was still carrying the woman, although the woman had long gone. A lot of us are not reaching our destination because we're still carrying the pain of the past. The weightiness of yesterday is still weighing us down, causing us pain today, keeping us from the place God wants us to arrive at. Nothing, and I mean nothing, will hinder you arriving at God's destiny for you like unforgiveness. If anybody had a right to be angry, bitter, and hold a grudge, it was Joseph. A dysfunctional family, a dysfunctional father put in a pit, sold into slavery, seduced, 
unjustly jailed, forgotten in jail, if anybody had a right to be mad, if anybody had a right to say life is not fair, it was Joseph. Joseph occupies from chapter 37 to chapter 50 of the book of Genesis. So God wanted us to zero in on this man's life. He gave so much of the first book of the Bible to it because he wanted to show us the key to destiny. And one of the things that Joseph was going to have to grapple with, that you and I will have to grapple with, if you're going to finish life having fulfilled the reason why God left you here, then you're going to have to, we're going to have to deal with the issue of forgiveness. First of all, let's define forgiveness because part of the problem is many people don't know what it is or they don't know if they've really done it. Forgiveness in the Bible means a decision to no longer credit an offense against an offender. Forgiveness has to do with a decision. Let's start with that. It is not first and foremost an emotion. Forgiveness is not how you're feeling in any given moment. It has to do with whether you have made the choice to delete the offense. If you are seeking revenge, if vengeance is yours, forgiveness has not occurred. Because when forgiveness occurs, the delete button is pushed, or as 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, you keep no record. Forgiveness can operate on two levels, unilateral forgiveness and transactional forgiveness. Unilateral forgiveness is when you forgive and the person hasn't asked for it, requested it, or repented of what they did to you. You are unilaterally, that is on your own, without their involvement, granting them forgiveness. The reason you grant unilateral forgiveness is so that you can keep going. Because nothing will hold you hostage to your detours, keeping you from your destiny like unforgiveness. But then there is a second level of forgiveness. Transactional forgiveness. Transactional forgiveness is where there is a desire for reconciliation and restoration.
manifestation of a relationship. It's where the person who has offended you is willing to confess and repent in order to restore what was broken. Now, I want to show you in chapter 45 the steps you take to validate your own forgiveness. Chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood before him. He cried, have everyone go out from me so that there is no man with me when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Here's how you know you're serious about forgiveness. You don't bring other people in who have nothing to do with the sin. He told all the Egyptians, y'all leave. Y'all are not involved with this. Y'all have nothing to do with this. I'm going to confront the offenders, but y'all get out. You always know a person who has not forgiven because of the gossip. They bring people in who have nothing to do with it, who can't fix it. They can't resolve it. They don't even know about it, but I want to bring them into it because I want to vent because I'm seeking vengeance. True forgiveness does not bring people into it who have nothing to do with it. So if you are gossiping to everybody else about the offense and the offendor, forgiveness has not occurred. Secondly, you know you have forgiven when you make the offender feel at ease with you. Verse 4, then Joseph said to his brethren, please Come closer to me. Ah. When you haven't forgiven, you say, get away from me. He says, come, you did me wrong. Come close to me. I am now welcoming you into my space. He makes them feel comfortable in his presence instead of making them feel uncomfortable in his presence. He says, come near, not get out of my sight. I can't stand you. Don't want to ever see you again. Get away from me. No, he says, come near to me. And these were the ones who've done him wrong. So forgiveness creates a space where the offender who repents, because we're talking about transactional forgiveness now, not unilateral, where the offender can come into a space they've been extricated from because of their offense. The next thing that happens. Verse 5. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. The next thing that true forgiveness will do is it will help the offender to forgive themselves when they've asked you to forgive them. And then he did one more thing. Wow. Verse 9. Harry and go to my father, Joseph says, and say to him, my father Jacob, say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. I, I don't want you to miss this. He tells his brothers, go back home and tell daddy, I'm okay. Up here, in Egypt. Wait a minute. You mean you're not going to tell him to go tell daddy what y'all did to me? You're not going to go back and tell daddy I want y'all to go back and I want y'all to tell daddy every little thing y'all did to me, how you did it, I want you to go tell daddy. What he did was he protected them from the one who would have been hurt most by it because he was seeking transactional forgiveness. If you're holding on to vengeance, watch this, then you are blocking God from taking care of it for you. If you're trying to pay him back yourself, then God will let you pay him back yourself. But God will stay out of it. The scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. God believes in justice. He believes in payback. His way, his time. And he does it without your help. 
I'm not talking about somebody who breaks the law. That's a legal issue. It should be addressed. But we're talking about personal vengeance. He says that I will repay. And if you read the story, you'll find out he did. Dr. Evans will have more for us on the link between forgiving and being forgiven when he comes back in a moment to continue this lesson from his series, Freedom Through Forgiveness. This short but powerful six-part set points the way toward the healing and fulfillment we can experience when we understand the mercy God has shown us and pass it along to those who've hurt us, even if those hurts feel like they're tearing us apart. Unforgiveness is like an emotional cancer, but the principles in this message collection are the cure. And we'll send it to you as our thank you gift when you make a contribution to help us keep Tony's teaching on this station. Along with it, we'll include his companion book for this series, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. It's a step-by-step, month-long journey toward freedom from the wrongs done to you or by you. Visit us at TonyEvans.org, make your contribution online, and let us send you a copy of the special two-resource package before time runs out next Wednesday. Or give us a call at 1-800-800-3222. Our resource center is open 24-7, so there's always someone waiting to help you. Again, that's TonyEvans.org, or call 1-800-800-3222. Well, Dr. Evans will come back with more of today's message right after this. It's beyond a Sunday sermon, a chance to really dig into the Bible and the kingdom in a new way. Anytime and anywhere, because it's all online. The Tony Evans Training Center, in-depth courses on all kinds of topics, Cultural Transformation, Intro to Expository Preaching, Jude, John, Hebrews, Old Testament, New Testament, and so much more. These aren't sermons. They're teaching courses to help you engage, understand Scripture, and not just to hear about, but to explore the kingdom of God on your own. Find out more at TonyEvansTraining.org. TonyEvansTraining.org. Take Judah. And the reason I want to talk about Judah is because he was the lead guy who got Joseph put in the hole to begin with when he was 17. Judah said, let's get rid of him. Well, if you read the story, you will find a whole chapter on Judah. Now, why is Judah put in this story with a whole chapter on him when the whole story is about Joseph? But there's a whole chapter on Judah because it's showing you how God pays somebody back who messes over you. Because when you read the story of Judah... In the middle of the story of Joseph, Judah starts losing his sons to death. He gets tricked by his daughter-in-law, has an affair with his daughter-in-law, giving birth to a child from his own daughter-in-law. His whole life crumbles because God will repay. But if you don't believe that, then you get to pay it without God. But if you believe that, then you know vengeance is mine. And you know when God moves, he moves. Ah. What helped Joseph to forgive? This was a painful situation he's lived through. Verse 50 through 52. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar priest of own bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. He named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. God set him up for forgiveness. He gave him a whole new family and he said, my new family helped me forget my old family. And the way he kept reminding himself that he was no longer hostage to his old family was in naming his kids. He named one Manasseh and one Ephraim. Manasseh means God has helped me to forget my troubles. Well, how often did he have to say the name Manasseh? Every time he was calling him to dinner, every time he was correcting him, when he was sending him to school, Manasseh this, Manasseh that, Manasseh this, Manasseh that. So every time he called Manasseh's name, God has helped me to forget. God has helped me to forget. God has helped me to forget. He named the baby exactly what he needed from God. But to help Manasseh out, 
You need to have a second baby. Ephraim. Ephraim means God has made me fruitful. Watch this now. And he says, in the land of my affliction. Okay, Manasseh, God has caused me to forget. That is the pain. Ephraim, he's blessing me where I am right now. See, if you get so locked into the past that you don't see the goodness of God that he is showing you right now. See, you need to say Manasseh, but then you got to turn and look at Ephraim. Because Ephraim says, oh, well, what that happened to me yesterday, but God is providing for me today. He's blessing me today. He's taking care of me today. And even though I had a bad yesterday, my baby's name is Ephraim today. Unforgiveness blocks you from the supernatural. Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You read further in the chapter and he says, for if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. We all have to remember we got two sides to our story. The need to forgive and the need to be forgiven. There are very few people who need to forgive who don't also need to be forgiven. Okay? Forgiveness is a beautiful word when you need it. It's an ugly word when you have to give it. But we all need both words. Because we need to be forgiven and we need to forgive. He says, and when you do, your Father who is in heaven will forgive you. He's not talking about your salvation. He's talking about your fellowship, your harmony, your experience with him. You no longer walk in darkness, John chapter 1 says. You're now living in the light. You're in the light of the supernatural. Your GPS is working now. He can move you on to the place he's taking you. God will recycle your pain to his purpose. Doesn't excuse it. Vengeance is mine. It doesn't say you ignore it. Not saying any of that. I'm saying you have a providentially sovereign God who can overrule it and fulfill his purposes in spite of it and in fact use it for where he's taking you. You've seen the movie. I'm sure 90% of you have the old movie Forrest Gump. You remember Forrest had a, a friend from his childhood days named Jenny. And one day Forrest and Jenny were walking along and they came across the shack in which she was raised, which was also the shack in which she was abused by her parents. When she walked by her old home, that shack, she looked at it, she reached down, she picked up a rock and threw it at the shack. Then she reached down she picked up another rock and threw it through the window of the shack. And then she reached down and she picked up another rock as she remembered the pain of the past. And after she had thrown as many stones or rocks as her energy would allow, she collapsed. And that's when Forrest looked at her and said, Jenny, Sometimes they're just on enough rocks. Because no matter how many you throw in, that shack is still up there. Some of us have been throwing stones at the shack. Uh, why did you do that? Why didn't you stop him? Why did I have to go through that? That was not fair. Stop! I can't take it anymore. You throw rocks, but the shack is still up. Because sometimes, there are not enough stones. Dr. Evans will come back in a moment with a final illustration to wrap up this message he calls The Detours of Pardon, part of his current series, Freedom Through Forgiveness. Copies of this individual message are available. Just visit TonyEvans.org to get the details. Better yet, request this entire six-lesson collection when you make a contribution toward the ministry of The Urban Alternative. And we'll send it to you along with the companion booklet I mentioned earlier, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. Just visit TonyEvans.org to get the details and make the arrangements. Or call us day or night at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. 
As you heard at the top of the program, the Urban Alternative is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. The expansion and growth we've experienced is nothing short of a miracle. And a lot of it traces back to the unique way Dr. Evans communicates across racial and cultural lines. Here's what he told me recently about how the Lord equipped him to do that. I was the fourth African-American student at Dallas Theological Seminary. So many of the students there were not used to being around black people. But because of my personality, I, I would take the initiative, build relationships. I could see those who didn't want it versus those who were open to it versus those who were confused about it. Went and knocked on doors, met professors, talked to them. So I would take the initiative to not only learn, but to build bridges. But at the same time, I went to a black church there, Community Bible Church, headed by a guy named Reuben Connor. And uh, this um, kept me in touch with the black community. And he had a ministry starting black churches. And so that kept me involved in black church ministry while attending a conservative white theological center. So I'm still operating on dual tracks. And so I think that, again, kept me in both worlds, biblical conservative theology, but operating in two directions. In one direction, I wanted to strengthen the biblical foundation in the African-American community. In the other direction, I wanted to increase the social sensitivity in the white community. Well, Dr. Evans says forgiving others releases us from one source of pain and prevents a brand new one. He'll tell us what it is tomorrow. But right now, he's back with a final thought for those who aren't feeling free enough to forgive. What you say, Pastor, I still feel it. I still feel it. Well, let me remind you about the bell. You know, the bell in the bell towers is on a rope. And you pull the rope. Bong! 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 And then they would let the rope go. And you'd still hear bong! 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 Because when they let go of the rope, the bell would still be swinging, but it would slow down until it stopped because they were no longer forcing it to ring. I want to invite you today to let go of the rope. Because as long as you pull in that bong, bong, it's not fair. Bong, you hurt me too bad. Bong, you never said I'm sorry. Bong, uh, as long as you're pulling the rope, you're going to hear in your soul the sound of the bell. But when you make the decision to let it go, it may ring for a little while. Bong, bong, bong. Until you feel it subside. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you.